From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Manus Granny in for Jonathan Farrow. It's taken us two years to put in new records and $10 trillion in value. Is it too rich for your blood? We'll discuss on the countdown to the open. It starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up this Monday, futures point to more record highs on the street. Investors brace for key inflation data ahead of the Fed. And the Republican primary narrows down to two candidates. We begin with a big issue, stress testing, that soft landing narrative. Here we are in a rally. The soft landing narrative. This soft landing environment. A lot of it is priced into markets at these levels. And it seems like the, the whole soft landing is happening. That seems more likely the case. At this point, the U.S. economy is faring quite well. This week, you know, uh, GDP numbers, PC numbers are going to be very important for the Fed outlook. Growth is going to likely to surprise us on the upside. We do expect growth to remain positive as we look further out into the new year, but at a slightly reduced pace. Frankly, the, the concept of the slowdown, the non-soft landing, is still on the shelf for now. We're also in the midst of the earnings season. So it's all about earnings at the moment. It's early days, but we have seen strength coming in from the earnings front. Tech earnings are supposed to be up in, in double digits. The equity market is looking at the strength of earnings. At the end of the day, if the economy delivers, earnings deliver, markets can move a bit higher. The non-soft landing is on the shelf for now. Let's discuss the situation. P. Jim's Greg Peters, Bob Elliott of Unlimited Gentlemen. Welcome to the show. A very good morning to you. So you just look at the velocity in these markets. Yes, yields have backed up. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq taking out new records. It's as if the consensus is just for a full bull market. Bob, let me take it to you first of all. Are you a full bull believer or, or any quaking at all? I think it just comes down to what momentum exists in this economy right now. And what we've seen through the end of 2023 was one of the biggest uh, financial market easings that we've seen in 40 years. And so given that circumstance into an economy that's already doing, you know, was doing fine through uh, the second half of last year, you're basically getting, if anything, a bit of acceleration in the economy. And I think beyond just the financial market easing and the benefit from falling bond yields, what we're now starting to see is equity market investors are recognizing that earnings may be actually a bit better than they were expecting, uh, at least initially here in 24. Well, Greg, let's take it to you. I, I, I like what Evercore had to say this morning. The dominant risk scenario is that inflation falls faster than expected and the Fed eases more aggressively uh, perhaps than is priced in at, at the moment. Is that, a, is that a thesis you can ascribe to? No, I think that's overplayed, honestly. I think the markets have leaned too much on that narrative. If you look at kind of the distribution, I think investors are, are really leaning on this. The Fed and central banks will aggressively cut here. Um, you know, inflation come down even more. I think the risk is the opposite. I'm pretty optimistic, actually. Uh, I feel like uh, the economy, particularly in the U.S., is uh, quite robust. Labor market still still strong. Inflation is coming down, but I think this last mile question is very much in play. And um, you know, I'm in the camp where the last mile, so to speak, is going to be more difficult, not easier. Yeah, well, certainly those uh, University of Michigan numbers on Friday helped the narrative on the disinflation side of the street. Let's talk about the data this week. Traders are bracing for key GDP prints on Thursday. Mike McKee joins me now. So this is, in theory, going to be a nice bullish trajectory. Mike, good morning. Good morning, Manis. Well, it is a backloaded week, certainly. The first three days of the week, Monday through Wednesday, that's today through Wednesday, not a whole lot going on in terms of data. We get leading index today, uh, Richmond Fed and the s and PMIs, which really won't move markets probably, but you're right. Then we get to Thursday, and Thursday is a very big day with fourth quarter GDP, jobless claims, new home sales, trade, durable goods orders. 
we're going to be talking about a lot there. And then on Friday, the biggest number of the week, the PCE inflation number, along with personal income and spending, people want to know, is inflation coming down? Uh, Bob mentioned uh, earlier that uh, it depend, things depend on how the economy develops from here. And right now, it looks like in the fourth quarter, it was slower than in the third, but the forecast is for basically uh, growth at a trend rate, at a, at a potential rate of about 2%. And that would set us up for a decent first quarter. We'll see what the numbers turn out to be here. Uh, and then here are the numbers that we're looking for on uh, Thursday and Friday. I mentioned the GDP number, but incomes are expected to have fallen a little bit, the, the rate of gain, and spending hanging in there. We saw that with the retail sales numbers. But the real number that we want to see is down in the lower right-hand corner there. That's core or PCE. The forecast we have right now from uh, economists that we survey is it'll come in on a year-over-year -year basis at 3%, but a lot of people who study this very closely say there's a good chance we get 2.9%. If we get a two-handle on that, that could really change some market psychology about what the Fed is going to do. Uh, finally, I just wanted to throw this in here because uh, th this is going to be the key to the PCE numbers. The difference between the PCE and CPI housing constructs. CPI, uh, this is a, a normalized version going back to 2016. CPI, it's a much bigger weight, and the way they calculate it, it shows housing prices much stronger than the PCE does. So if you're looking for the possibility of a two-handle on PCE inflation, it may well come from housing this time. Mike, thank you very much. Yeah, let's see whether the housing market lights up again uh, later this year. Bob Elliott, Greg Peters are with me. Let's just take what Mike put on the table there for us. Um, it's all about that print on the PCE, which is critically important to the bond market and to the risk narrative. A sub 3% print on PCE. What would that do, Greg Peters, to the pricing in the bond market? Obsessed by six, seven cuts with the Fed at three, would it close that gap? Would it, would, would it change the narrative if we get a sub 3% print in the PCE, Greg? Yeah, so I think it's a big psychological barrier. Uh, so below three, it's closer to two, of course, but you're still not at two. So there's still lots of room to go uh, in terms of the disinflation is concerned. But the the labor market uh, and what that means for wages and how that flows through services is critically important. Um, and then, as uh, Mike was talking about, housing. So uh, all eyes are on housing. So it's about the components of uh, core inflation now. Uh, and that is really a, a close lens on uh, labor and housing. Uh, Bob, let me take it to you. I mean, that, that sub 3%, what would that do for you and your perspective on the rest of the year? Because they'll all start to cry about 50 basis point cuts. Once we get a reasonable level below 3%, you can just hear them, you know, sort of almost like in the football stands, crying for 50 basis point cuts at a time. But how would you look at a sub 3% point? Well, I think mostly that sub 3% print is priced into market expectations. And particularly when you look at what's priced into the short rate market in 2024, uh, that six to seven cuts that are already priced in are reflective of an expectation of a significant moderation in inflation. The real question from the Fed's perspective is whether or not just getting inflation back down uh, to close to their mandate is enough to start to create a substantial cutting cycle, particularly when we have a situation where growth is pretty good and asset prices are making new highs. Plus, there's the concern about break-even inflation and long-dated break-even inflations starting to rise back up here as asset prices improve. And so I think part of the, the, site, the insight that you can get is from the SCP which isn't just saying that they're going to cut three times, but it's it's reflective or, or it, it it is consistent also with a period of time where unemployment rises to 4.1%. So the idea that the Fed's going to immediately start cutting if unemployment stays here in the threes, growth is pretty good, and PCE just moves to mandate, it's not obvious that they're going to get the sort of cuts that are currently priced into the short rate market for 24. Well, let's try and just square it away with a little bit uh, of reflection on assets. Uh, Greg, if I bring it back to you, I've got Morgan Stanley, I've got JP Morgan saying, on this backup in yields, you, you want to stagger into this, you want to layer into this on, on the bond side. I mean, the table is set to, I suppose, uh, 
justify that kind of narrative for you? Is this rich enough for you to step back into duration of these levels? I think that's too cute of a narrative. Um, you know, we see a very wide range actually uh, for the 10 year this year, uh, you know, almost 100 basis points. So, I mean, maybe there's a little value from a trading perspective, but not a ton. Uh, we don't see the same kind of rate cuts coming through. The markets have been so aggressive in terms of that pricing. We think that pricing will will come out of the market. We're so data driven. Uh, we have geopolitical risk. So I think to uh, be so declarative in such a volatile, uncertain market uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. So can can I ask you where you see the equilibrium now, rate then? Perhaps, the, yeah. perhaps the, the more pressing question is where do you see the equilibrium rate? That's what Stephen Major and the HSBC team are talking about that's more important than whether it's two cuts, three cuts. Where do you set your equilibrium weight in the medium term? Yeah, so I mean, if you use the SEP, I think the SEP is, uh, you, you know, the long term real interest rate. You know, we do see. Uh, uh, you know, above zero, which is not where it was. Uh, so we think uh, there's some scope for rates to move lower, but not a tremendous amount. So if you just kind of take the nominal 10 year as an example, you know, our our kind of fulcrum uh, is around 4%. So uh, plus or minus around that. Bob, let me just square, square it away with you. 35% from the October lows. We're trading uh, a value up of $10 trillion on equities. Is this market too rich for you to, to step into, or do you think it's still got valuation to go? I think it really comes down to a, a momentum trade here. And the basic idea is that um, as the economy continues to press higher and reaccelerate here uh, in the early part of 2024, we're really seeing uh, what you'd expect to play out from a macro perspective, which is stocks mm -hmm. that consistently outperform bonds. And I think we're set up in a circumstance for that to persist uh, for at least the first half here of the year. OK. Well, we're all in for the first half. I don't think anybody has any perspective of what the medium term is. <laughs> Bob Elliott. Uh, Greg Peters, thank you very much. You're going to stick with us. We've got a little bit more work to do. Look under the hood. Uh, Abby is back in the seat ahead of the opening bell. Abigail, what have we got? Well, despite the fact that we have futures higher, we have a couple of notable names uh, down, down sharply. In fact, if we start off with the shares of Gilead, the bioscience giant, well, this stock at the lows down more than 10% right now, down 10.5%. This, of course, is a late stage lung cancer treatment failed to improve survival. Investors not liking the outcome of that binary event. Archer Daniels Midland, the ag giant, down 17% or thereabouts. This after they placed their CFO on leave, they've cut their earnings guide and something that no investor wants to hear, an investigation into their accounting practices really weighing on those shares. And then a bright spot, Macy's up 1.5%. The department store rejected a $5.8 billion offer uh, from an investor conglomerate. Uh, that's roughly $21 per share, 19% above the Friday close. They're saying they don't think it offers compelling value. The fact that they rejected it maybe has some investors hoping that they think that there's a, a better alternative. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye on those stocks. Abigail, thank you very much. Coming up on the show, the GOP race is down to two. I am today suspending my campaign. I'm proud to have delivered on 100% of my promises, and I will not stop now. The latest on the 2024 campaign trail next on Bloomberg. today suspending my campaign. I'm proud to have delivered on 100% of my promises, and I will not stop now. It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee, and I will honor that pledge. He has my endorsement because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear. Cutting and running, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announcing his exit from the 2024 presidential race narrows the GOP field. The focus now turns to New Hampshire, where the former President Donald Trump and former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley will square off in the state's primary election tomorrow. And we've got the latest CNN polls. This is what we've got. Trump leading Haley with 50% support among the likely Republican primary voters. Bloomberg's Katie Lyons has the latest now. Katie, good to see you on the road in Manchester, in New Hampshire. So it wasn't so much people were saying a shock that DeSantis has gone. It's just the timing 
of it. So here we are. The field is narrowing. The question that Terry Haynes raises is, where do the lost voters go that have disappeared from DeSantis uh, and from Chris Christie? Good morning. Good morning, Manus. Yes, that exactly is the question. Of course, Ron DeSantis, when announcing his departure from this race yesterday, said that if he could have campaigned more, if he could have done more interviews, he would have. But ultimately, he saw no path to victory. And that is why he has exited this race really on the eve of this New Hampshire first in the nation primary. The thing is, he wasn't much of a factor here in New Hampshire to begin with. Yes, he came in second place in Iowa, but here in New Hampshire in polling, he was in the low single digits, something around 6%. So it's not like there are really that many DeSantis votes that will be shifting uh, to either Nikki Haley or Donald Trump here. It does seem the prevailing thinking among Republican strategists I've talked to is that the majority of those votes will be going to Donald Trump. But Trump was already leading Haley here even before DeSantis dropped out. That lead, though, has just expanded as we've gotten closer to actually this primary vote happening in the latest Suffolk University Boston Globe poll this morning, Trump is 19 points ahead of Haley. Now, as we've gotten closer to the vote tomorrow, Nikki Haley does seem like she's starting to lower expectations for herself, as are her surrogates. Haley said she just wants to perform stronger than she did in Iowa, where, of course, she came in third. And her biggest surrogate here in New Hampshire, the governor, Chris Sununu, who I spoke with yesterday, said she doesn't need to win. A strong second is what they're looking for. That said, New Hampshire is the electorate that really Haley's candidacy is trying to cater to. There is a lot more Republican moderates here, a lot more independents, unlike Iowa, which leans very conservative. So if she can't pull it off here, it is difficult to see the path for her campaign moving forward. Of course, the South Carolina primary, her home state, is about a month from now on February 24th. But if she can't win in New Hampshire, there is a question of whether or not she can sustain momentum to get her to that point in the race, especially when candidate, uh, former candidate after former candidate and others are all falling in line behind, behind Donald Trump as he remains the far and away front runner, Manus. Yeah, and the velocity behind him getting that nomination is a lot quicker and a lot earlier than we saw in, in 2016. Kaylee, we wish you well. Enjoy yourself there in New Hampshire on the road, the whole Bloomberg political team, Kaylee Lyons. Uh, my guests this morning are Bob Elliott and Greg Peters. Gentlemen, you've been through a cycle or two, perhaps more than me. It's my first American election. You're veterans. So with that in mind, um, we are seeing this field narrow quite aggressively quite, earlier, quite early. What did you learn from 2016 that you now reflect and you go, this is how I'm looking at this at the moment? Bob, take it away. I think the most important thing, uh, lessons from both 2016 and 2020, is that um, what ultimately happens on election day there's is is uh, is less certain than I think many would hope for. And so, in that sense, I think you know most folks from a markets perspective should be looking at this and ensuring that they're not overweight one particular. Uh, candidate success versus another as they navigate through this, what will inevitably be a very volatile uh, political uh, story over the course of, of the year. I think the thing that's probably interesting here relative to where we were a couple of uh, cycles ago is that the parties are more aligned when it comes to their fiscal policy in aggregate than maybe they have been in the past. Um, seeing fiscal expansion pressures uh, from both sides mm -hmm. of the aisle here through the course of the last, say, four years. And it's really going to be a question of what does that composition look like? Is the fiscal expansionary policy going to look more tilted towards lower income uh cohorts uh, getting transfer payments, or is it going to look more like tax benefits uh, for corporations and higher income individuals? That's really the mix. It's less about the overall spending profile and more about the mix from a policy perspective. It's about, you know, where, where does the benefit come down? And I suppose, Greg, I was reflecting back to 2016. We've got a lovely article on the Bloomberg Terminal this morning which talks about, you know, what happened then and perhaps we'll have a less volatile reaction now. 10 billion went out of bond markets, um, the biggest since the taper tantrum of 2013. But when you look back at 2016 and 2020, you know, is it too early? Is it too early to have a little bit of a hedge in there? I think it is too early. Um, and I think the response will be different as well. If you go back uh, to the you know, 2016, I think what took the bond market by surprise was the um, deficit expansion. Uh, so 
I don't think that'll be a surprise this time. I think both parties are aligned, uh, so to speak. Uh, the contours will be different, but I think deficits, deficits are here to stay. But I actually think if there is a change in leadership, uh, it'll be a much more violent reaction this time around than what we've seen before, as I think you know, Europe in particular uh, uh, is preparing uh, for such a change. And if you look at a lot of the policies um, you know, a lot of those policies uh, could get rolled back, and I think that'll be uh, quite meaningful. Uh, and if you look at just one aspect, uh, the the change in the labor market uh, mm -hmm. could be quite important as we've seen a real expansion uh, in, in labor here in the U.S., foreign labor in particular, and a much tighter immigration policy could really roll that back uh, and has have a real effect on uh, inflation. So Very I think briefly. it's different. Briefly, before I go back to Bob, can I just, you know, deficits are here to stay, but will they be tolerated ad, no, ad nauseum by the bond market? The, the Brits find out that that doesn't always happen. Briefly? I think so. It's always tricky. It doesn't matter till it matters. Uh, so uh, I don't think that is a predominant concern, but I mm -hmm. think it will be a lingering concern. Okay, uh, Bob. Let me just t take it back to you in, in, in terms of thinking about uh, mar in thinking about markets as as we close out in this New Hampshire. Um, we've got a lot to be bullish about, uh, but what are you most concerned about? Well, I think the main question is whether we get a reacceleration in inflationary pressures. We're we're really in this sort of perfect moment where PCE is printing. Um, right at where the Fed yeah. wants it to print uh, over the last couple of months. And the question is, is that able to persist? Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons why one uh, should be cautious, in, including the Fed. First of all, just break even inflation pricing out on the curve is starting to rise, which uh, reflects, you know, is, is market based reflections of rising concerns about longer term inflationary dynamics, but also the big reasons for the dr big drivers of this decline in PCE inflation, things like falling gas prices, falling auto okay. prices, uh, the decline in durable goods prices, those all have to persist. Those declines in prices have to continue in order to continue to get PCE inflation at this level. Okay. If they don't, they just moderate. We could easily see PCE pop up in the later half of the year. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Bob Elliott, Greg Peters there with the very latest on the markets coming up. The morning calls and State Street's Laurie Hanel joins me with her views for 2024 on Bloomberg. Some morning calls to set you up this Monday. Oppenheimer downgrading lows to market perform, citing a challenging environment for home improvement. Morgan Stanley names Western Digital as its top pick among the U.S. semiconductor stocks, highlighting compelling valuation compared to the peers. And finally, HSBC cuts Lululemon. Price tag, 500 bucks. It took us two years to make these new record highs across U.S. equities. We've added $10 trillion in value. They're getting ready to fly to somewhere very special up there uh, at the uh, NYSE. This is State of Play. Equities are higher. We're careering through uh, new record highs in terms of valuations. You need to ask yourself, a forward PE of 20, is that rich for your blood? We are in an earnings season where financials are outperforming. It's a huge week uh, for Netflix and technology. Euro dollar flat. Yields and tenure government bonds, waiting for the PC, sub 3%. What would that do to bonds? Would it create a rally? Sub 4%. And oil is up 1% at 74.11 this morning. At one stock to watch at the open, it's Macy's. The retailer saying it's not interested in a $5.8 billion takeover from the investors. Abigail Doolittle will justify the narrative for Macy's. Good morning, Abby. Good morning, Manis. And it seems that Macy's knows its value when it comes to potential suitors. Very, very picky, as you said, rejecting that $5.8 eight billion dollar bid from a group of investors twenty one dollars per share 19 percent above friday's close given the fact that this stock is still down 75 percent from its all-time high it suggests that if they're not taking that bid and they did review it but the board said that that they were not going
going to sign an NDA and they were not going to do due diligence, it suggests that they think that maybe there's a better offer to come or that they will learn how to go it on their own and be more successful in doing so. So while they are not pursuing this possible deal, Manus, and we do have the stock off the highs, at the highs, the stock had been up solidly, again, supporting this idea that investors think that maybe something better is to come. CEO Jeff Gannett did say that the company will be open to opportunities that are in the best interest of the company and shareholders. Stay tuned. Okay, Abby, thank you very much. Let's turn our attention back to Boeing and the airlines. The FAA is asking the airline to check the door plugs on a second 737 model after more issues were found. Katie Greifeld is with me. So this is an older form of the 737. Size and scope. Katie, good morning. Good morning, Manis. Yeah, Boeing down a hair this morning as that scrutiny spreads. The FAA now recommending that airlines expect Boeing's 737-900ER models as well. Now, remember, the model that was involved in that Alaska Air incident earlier this month was a MAX 9. But the 900ER uses the same type of plug that failed on that MAX 9. Now, the FAA said in a statement that this move will offer, quote, an added level of safety, given that some 900ER operators have noted findings with bolts of this model during their inspection. That also according to the regulator. Now, obviously, manufacturing quality is undergoing intense scrutiny at the moment. The FAA launching a probe into Boeing quality. That's in addition to increasing its oversight of production and manufacturing. Boeing, for its part, says that uh, it fully supports the FAA in this action. Now, of course, this entire episode, if you want to call it that, it's really left a mark on Boeing shares. They're down 18 percent already in 2024. That is the worst performance in the Dow, Manus. OK, well, we've got a spectacular drop on Archer Daniels this morning. Katie, thank you very much. Let's move the agenda along. Talking agriculture, ADM placing their CFO on leave cutting their forecast and they have an investigation that is ramping up. Isabel Lee joins me now with the details. Isabel. Hi, Manus. Investigation is sending the stock spinning lower by 18%. That's the biggest drop since 2005. And as you can see, shares are still down by almost 17%. Lots of moving parts here, but shares really tumbled when the company said on Sunday afternoon that Vikram Luthar, its CEO since 2002, was put on leave. And we have Ismail Royd, who will serve as the interim CFO. And ADM is also delaying its fourth quarter earnings and the filing of its annual report and Form 10-K for 2023. So lots of moving parts here. And so far, things aren't looking good for the company, Manus. Okay, as well. Thank you very much for the details on that. Let's turn our attention back to the airlines. This is a battle royal. JetBlue and Spirit appealing the ruling that's blocking its planned $3.8 billion merger. Natalia Kanijevic joins me now with the details. Hope lives eternal, Natalia. So, yes, the move comes after a U.S. judge blocked this deal, saying that this will lead to higher prices and fewer choices for U.S. customers. Now, JetBlue needs uh, 200 aircraft and about 300 pilots from uh, Spirit. At the same time, Spirit needs financial support. Some analysts are saying that without this deal, Spirit may file for a bankruptcy or a liquidation. Spirit is trying to manage its finances is trying to pay down its debt, refinance uh, some of its uh, debt. The, a large part of $1.1 billion is coming uh, in September 2025. But this comes at a time when costs are rising. They have a new contract with pilots, and they have to pay 34% more in the next two years. Overall, stock plunged 67% last week, and uh, now basically many sell side analysts are getting more bearish. We see a huge spike in shorts. Short sellers are betting against the stock. And the key question, man, is will JetBlue fight for this deal? Because when they made an offer, they offered the $33.5 a share in cash. And now Spirit shares are trading at around $6 a share. Okay, Natalia, keeping an eye on those airlines throughout the street this morning. State Street's Laurie Hanna joins me now ahead of this year. She writes this. We anticipate uncertainty to persist. Subtrain growth projected across global economies. 2024 will likely be a year of flux, with many factors pressuring the path to the global economy. You wouldn't think that if you look at the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Now, Laurie, good to see you this morning. Uh, I mean, we're sort of like full bull, but should I have a little bit of metal jacket around me? Good morning. 
<laughs> Good morning. Yes, we think that 2024 is going to be a lot more precarious than markets are certainly uh, appreciating right at this moment in time. Um, certainly, we've seen the Fed signal that they're done raising rates, but they haven't started to reduce rates yet. And we still believe that there is more to come in terms of you know, tight policy working its way through the system on refinancings and things of that nature. So we do think it's a year where we're going to need to see earnings momentum, uh, which early days looks pretty good in the U.S., uh, but it's one where um, the kind of lofty valuation levels give us some pause. And that's where I, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper. Everybody has their own preferred theory. You know, I've got a couple of stats. The, Na the Nasdaq is trading 30 times its profits, yet I look at Magnificent Seven and we expect profits to drop from low 50 percent uh, rise to 46 percent. So on a, an profits times earnings, is it getting rich or has it got capacity to grow further? Well, we think if you just look at trailing earnings, you'd say it's rich in here. And this is the crux of the matter is what will earnings be going forward? And will companies be able to navigate still, you know, impressive inflationary pressures in a lot of pockets, albeit uh, declining somewhat? Mm -hmm. Will they be able to navigate the slowing growth environment? And where are those companies who have some resiliency in their balance sheets and in their revenue streams to be able to work through this? So we do think it's going to be a pretty precarious uh, time, not just because of current valuations, but what that implies about forward valuations based on forward earnings. And in terms of the S&P, if you look at that, that's trading as well. Some would say sub its peak, uh, you know, we're trading around 20 times on forward earnings on the S&P 500. The peak was a couple of years ago, 23. Uh, again, the, the question there is, do you think that it broadens out? Is there still, is there still an opportunity there to go below the index itself and, and to, broaden your, to broaden the position there? Well, a couple of things there. I mean, first and foremost, again, as I just mentioned, it's not just about what the current level of price earnings is, but what the forward earnings capacity is and how that's going to evolve and how much confidence you have yeah. in those earnings being able to expand through time. And that gets back to the crux of your, your question. We do think that this market broadens out. We do think that the sort of narrow, um, you know, magnificent seven kind of drive in, in stock market over the last year or so has to be complemented by some broadening out. And we're starting to see that. Certainly, we're starting to see financials participate. We're starting to see other parts of the market. So we think that we're in a place where equities going forward can do okay, but that's going to be dependent upon earnings coming through and the breadth of the market. Now, look, we, we've seen this rates market readjust. I mean, it was almost a, a quasi easing that you had in financial conditions in November and in December. We've backed up a little bit. Here we are on the bond market, uh, and I've had various notes come through this morning from Morgan Stanley and from JP Morgan. Now is the time to buy the belly of the curve. Now is the time to reconsider some, some duration. Does that make sense for you, the belly of the curve, at five years to pick that up at the moment? It does. And, and we've said in our market outlook for 2024 that we think the best place to deploy capital is actually in rates. Uh, and we actually think that that part of the curve looks pretty attractive, both because we do think that growth will continue to slow. Uh, we do think that inflationary pressures will come down. And we do believe that the Fed will ease. And all of those things, those three things really do point to relative value in that part of the curve. Mind you, we could also get some incremental appreciation if things slow even more precariously than we envisage. So we think that's a good place from a risk reward standpoint. Consensus is just so bullish. I'm always queasy. You know, it was so <laughs> bullish last year. China will reopen, buy luxury stocks. What I can't remember what else it was. Recession will come. Recession didn't come. China did not go at full bull. Uh, luxury found it hard to put through price rises at the end of the year. Are you? Do you join me in a glass of moderate skepticism with consensus so bullish? Well, I, I do. Although I would say that there are pockets that are actually not participated at all. I mean, China being foremost among those. Um, so there is some, there are some pockets around the globe where we do think that there's going to be a lot more stress going forward. We think emerging markets is still a place where we would tread cautiously, particularly in the equities. We think Europe, while 
pretty attractively valued, has a lot of headwinds as well. And oh, by the way, we've got this massive set of geopolitical tensions uh, that are likely to weigh on market sentiment over the coming year. So uh, I do think you have to be uh, very defensive in here, look at quality stocks, look at those places where the risk reward is pretty attractive and, uh, you know, try to try to hold some cash so you can take uh, advantage of opportunities as they present. And, and, and last year, a lot of people held on to a lot of cash, didn't they? And, and here is the question mm -hmm. between the money market, between the money market funds uh, and institutional hoarding of cash. Do you see that being incrementally released back into the market? Because there's a, there's a risk, isn't there, that you wait too long for the rate cuts to come before you deploy and perhaps you miss the train. What is your thinking in terms of the time release valve, if, if we can think of it that way, on the money market funds? and on the money in CDs? Well, at the margin, more flow into equities out of cash would be a good thing for markets. But let's just not forget that that's still a relatively small number versus the market capitalization of equity. So we don't think it's the major thing that will move the market. And oh, by the way, what we've seen is consumers tend to be late to deploy those cash assets into markets. So it may take a couple of rate cuts before they actually realize uh, that money market funds aren't the most attractive place to be. So we don't think that that's going to be the thing that will drive markets higher. It's going to have to be earnings coming through and more confidence in the global economy. Just to reflect back for one global perspective. It, I'm looking at the positioning in China. Again, if I go back a year ago, it was about the momentum in China. I look at the Hang Seng Enterprises at a two-year low in Hong Kong overnight. UBS say you need punchier, punchier policy to really get involved in China. The fund managers cut their allocation there. At what level are you allocating to China and to Asia? Well, first of all, for a couple of years now, we've been recommending to our clients that they separate out China from their broader emerging markets allocation, both because it was such a large proportion of the index and because we thought that the drivers of China recovery and China you know, performance were likely to be disconnected from the broader emerging markets complex. So we, we think that that first thing you would do is you just separate out your China allocation so you can make those tactical bets based on what you see in China. Look, China's got a lot of challenges. It's slowing much more than people had envisaged. Uh, they continue to have challenges in terms of population and unemployment and real estate and a variety of other things. And oh, by the way, without the same kind of policy flexibility that they enjoyed over the last decade. So we would very much tread cautiously on China at this point in time. Okay. Uh, Laurie, thank you very much for being with me. That is State Street's uh, Laurie Hanna with the risk rewards and a little bit of caution on your China exposure. Coming up, a whirlwind, two weeks of central bank decisions to kick off 2024. Our view in the end is that we think there's a very good chance they do 50 in, in March. So not, not even just 25, but a 50 basis point cut and start with a bang. More on the rate cut trajectories for 2024 in just a moment on Bloomberg. Because inflation's fallen so much, the Fed can afford to be very aggressive. And on top of that, because of the U.S. election, the Fed would not want to act too much in the second half of this year. So essentially, they're going to try to force all of their cuts into the first half of this year. And so our view in the end is that we think there's a very good chance they do 50 in, in March. So not, not even just 25, but a 50 basis point cut and start with a bang. That was Bilal Hafez there of Macro Hive weighing in on where he sees the future Fed moves. And we're going to get a flurry of central bank decisions over the next two weeks. The BOJ kicks things off on Tuesday where they lay the groundwork for exiting negative rates and yield curve control. The ECB follows on Thursday. The Fed delivers their decision the following Wednesday. And finally, we hear from the Bank of England next Thursday. But first, let's start with the ECB. Christine Lagarde saying last week in Davos that it's likely that the ECB will cut interest rates this summer. Bloomberg's Zoe Schneeweiss joins me now from Berlin. So there she was at Bloomberg House in Davos, um, laying the groundwork for timing, but with many caveats. The market, how did it embrace the summer prospect of a cut? 
um, the market did actually moderate its um, rate bets because the market before that had seen rate bets as um, at 80 percent likelihood for an April move already. And the next move after that would be that June move, which is what actually most of the policymakers seem to be hinting at. We've got one or two doves who maybe say earlier. But overall, there's some vi vital wage data coming, and that won't be here till late April, maybe early May. So that's why they'll need to wait to the next meeting after that, and that's the June meeting, to look for cuts. So this week will be hold, but we will be looking very much for any hints that um, Lagarde may provide on the timing. So tell me this. The market is pricing, in, as you say, we, we, we've shaved back a bit of our enthusiasm. But the market overall was hoping for 150, 160 basis points from the ECB. Is inflation, is the disinflation narrative in Europe as robust as it is in the US? Um, maybe not quite. We do have, we have the danger here that there are some upticks again. We saw an uptick of inflation in December, and just with so-called base effects mean that there is the danger that now the next few months there could be additional upticks. Nothing drastic, not, nothing like the 10.6 inflation rate we saw in October 2022, but still that's obviously going in the wrong direction if there are any upticks. And again, there's the scare here that those tensions we see in the Red Sea, or again, that wage data will again drive rates and will drive inflation expectations, which is the thing that ECB really is looking at, will drive them up and then mean that they can't um, start cu um, cutting rates in June even. Okay, well, the Italians must be cheering this morning for a Monday. Italy, German bond spreads, the lowest in almost two years, gone from the heady days of the debt crisis. Zoe, thank you very much. Let's see what comes over the next couple of weeks. Zoe Schneeweiss in Berlin. Uh, turn our attention to the BOJ. Mike McKee is beside me here. So, Mike, um, what kind of guidance from the BOJ might we get? Because that seems to be the building, the building narrative. It'll be a, maybe about guidance rather than action. Yeah, they've given us a lot of hints about what they want to do, but no hint about timing. And that's what people are going to be looking for this week. Uh, the Bank of Japan has two things that they've got to deal with. One is, as you mentioned earlier, negative interest rates. They haven't had their main policy rate above zero for many, many years, the blue line there. And then, of course, what are they going to do about yield curve control? They've basically taken it off, but the market is acting like there is still a cap on the 10-year note yield. And so we'll see if they give us any guidance on which one of those. The market certainly thinks that something is coming. JGB volume has woken up. It's now kind of at the highest rate that we have seen since the great financial crisis. All of a sudden, people are getting active again. But they don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. The economists at this point think there's a 0% chance of any policy change, the ones we've surveyed. Only an 8% chance in March. It's April that gets most of the attention. People are looking at, at at this point, about a 60% chance that the Bank of Japan does something in April. And the reason is, in March, they conclude wage negotiations across the country. They uh, do some pattern bargaining with many different uh, companies. And what the Japanese want is something very different from what the ECB and the Fed wants. They want higher wages because it'll keep inflation up. This is the prime minister yesterday saying it's essential to raise pay at small and medium-sized companies. Uh, so if they get that, uh, then we are likely to see the Bank of Japan do something in April. Until then, it's all going to be about the hinting. Indeed. And he talks about a wage growth outpacing prices needed for a virtuous circle. Uh, always interesting when you hear politics versus central bankers. Mike, thank you very much. Mike McKee and dollar yen is probably one of the biggest disappointing trades out there. 147.83 is where we trade. Uh, let's see what the Bank of Japan can do to the yen tomorrow. Let's get under the hood into the sectors. Abigail Doolittle is with me. Well, we do, of course, have the S&P 500 at another all-time high today, Manus, and it's a broad sector composition supporting that gain. Three up days in a row for the S&P 500. Real estate, the best sector, all components of that sector higher. I'm not exactly sure what's behind that, but then right behind it, communication services. To the downside, we have very small declines for consumer staples and energy. So again, this gain that we have today, very well supported from a number of the sectors, the breadth that people want. As for the big participation, though, in recent days, weeks, and frankly, the year, last over the last year, 
big tech, well, there's that nice Fang Plus index over the last five days, up more than 3.5% into, of course, ahead some of those mega cap tech earnings. Yep, we're expecting, what, a 46% growth in profits. Let's hope that they deliver. Abigail, thank you very much. Great work on the sectors there. Coming up on the show, the events that you need to watch for your trading diary. This is Bloomberg. Just a quick look at equity markets. You've got a little bit of breath coming in there. The Russell up 1.74%. Again, continuing through uh, with record highs on these equity markets. You're going to get a little bit of tech flavor uh, this week from Tesla, from Netflix, uh, to name but a few. Your trading diary, this is what else will focus the mind. The BOJ rate decision uh, and the New Hampshire primary. Plus, as I say, Netflix reports their earnings. Have you shared your password? Wednesday, tech earnings continue. Tesla and IBM. And then Thursday, it's the ECB's turn. We'll also get the U.S. GDP, expecting a strong growth in the U.S. And American Express reports on Friday. That was Kind Eye to the Open. This is Bloomberg.